It's this. Greetings, I'm Aaron Balladay, and this is Mi Chuan Guan Dao Fa, Secretly Transmitted Methods of the Guan Dao, my ridiculous series discussing all things Guan Dao. In this video, I'll be talking about what a Guan Dao is. What is a Guan Dao? Looking specifically at the weapon's shape, length, and weight. So to start things off, I'm going to talk about the shape of Guan Dao, and in order to demonstrate that, I'm going to take down one of my modern Guan Dao. So this is just kind of a typical... I guess what you would call a Wu Shu Guan Dao. So a Guan Dao that is used for form practice. It has a very thin, wobbly blade. It's not designed for, you know, practice cutting or sparring or anything like that. But to demonstrate the weapon's shape, I think it's a, a perfectly fine example. There are three main parts to Guan Dao. There is the blade, there is a pole, and then at the other end here we have a butt spike. So taking a closer look at the blade of a Guan Dao. So it has, you know, basically it has a crescent shape. So this end is the edge. Obviously this isn't sharp. Um, so it has an edge and then it, you know, towards the tip, it sweeps backwards. Um, on the back of the blade, let me get it in a position where it's easier to see there. So on the back of the blade, we have some kind of gnarly spikes and interesting shapes. Um, and then importantly, we also have this one slightly upward facing uh, hook. And so this upward facing hook is a very important feature of a Guan Dao, and it is used in Guan Dao technique. This is a, a, a hook that you use to trap your opponent's weapon, usually a, a spear. So, so this is something you see on all Guan Dao. This upper part can be lots of different shapes as long as it has this upward facing hook on the back. I like to think of the shape of a Guan Dao as being a little bit like like a crab claw or a lobster claw. <laughs> Something like that. Um, so um, moving on we have a, a guard below so this is a slightly it's kind of like a slightly cup-shaped guard something very common on uh, Chinese Dao. Not all Guan Dao have guards but m most do or many do. Um, then we have the pole. Now, uh, this pole it has a circular, a circular cross section. Um, I noticed a lot of videos, a lot of people discussing European pole arms, and they'll, they like to point out that historically a lot of pole arms were uh, square cross section or rectangular cross, cross section, or maybe sometimes ovular cross section. And a lot of people like to point out that these kinds of shapes are actually much more preferable to a circular cross section because it is easier to index. So it is easier when you're grabbing the blade, if it is a square shape or a rectangular shape, you get a sense of where the blade alignment is. Now, I've never seen a modern Guandao that has a pole that is any cross section other than circular. And also looking at kind of versions of the weapon from the late imperial period, I, I've never held an actual Guandao from the late imperial period. Uh, but uh, I have seen some you know, photos and illustrations that would suggest to me that some of them were also a circular cross-section in the pole. Um, I've never seen any evidence to suggest they were anything other than circular, but that doesn't mean that they weren't circular or, or that they weren't um, rectangular or ovular. It's certainly a possibility. I've just never seen any evidence to think that, that could be the case. Um, so moving to the other end of the weapon, we have the butt spike. And so the, you know, the butt spike is, you know, kind of a spear shape. This one has three edges. And so this is probably the most common butt spike we see on, Guan, on modern Guandao. And it has these rings, which are cool, and they rattle, and they make cool sounds. Um, so that's a very typical butt spike for a modern Guandao. Um, so that's the basic shape of a, of a modern Guan Dao. Again, we have this crescent-shaped blade with an upward-facing hook on the back, and then a pole, and then a butt spike. Um, so now let's look at some Guan Dao from the late imperial period. 
And so kind of instantly I think we can see that the Guandao from the late imperial period are actually pretty consistent with modern Guandao. We still see a crescent-shaped blade with an upward-facing hook on the back end and a pole and a spike at the bottom. So we still have the same basic shape overall, but there are some important differences that I think are worth pointing out. So first off, the blades on the Guandao from the late imperial period tend to be kind of much longer and more slender. And the hook on the back of the Guandao from the late imperial period tend to be much more distinct, much larger. I think we get a much, a much better crab claw shape from the, the late imperial Guandao, whereas the, the hooks on the back of modern Guandao uh, are really quite small and almost insubstantial by comparison. Um, the Guandao from the late imperial period often had these dragon um, dragon shapes on the twin call, so the, the twin call, the blade collar, and so I have a, pu, a couple of uh, pu dao up here that also have dragons on the on the twin call. Um, so it's still a fairly common uh, motif on modern Guandao. Another important difference between modern Guandao and Guandao from the late imperial period is the butt spike. So as I was mentioning before, modern Guandao tend to have pretty much the same butt spike. Uh, a three-sided spear shape, maybe with rings or other, some some other kind of, um, you know, decoration. Uh, but the butt spikes from Guandao in the late imperial period, you know, some of them are quite small or even, you know, maybe no butt spike at all, maybe just a shaped pole, you know, kind of a, a pole that's been carved into a spear shape. Whereas some Guandao have really massive, elaborate uh, butt spikes. And the shapes can be quite different too. So some of the, or a lot of them from the late imperial period are this kind of wavy shape. And in fact, some texts refer to them as a zuan, as a drill. Um, but some of them are really much more spear-like and kind of straightforward in, in a sense. So, and it's, you know, something that's, I, I think is not to be overlooked because the butt spike is a very important part of Guandao. It provides counterbalance to the blade so when you have a really heavy blade at one end, if you counterbalance that with a, you know, a kind of a, a, a heavier butt spike, that makes swinging the weapon much easier. Um, so it really does affect the way the weapon is held and used. So again, to just summarize quickly, I think the overall shape of Guandao from the late imperial period are really quite similar, not only to uh, modern weapons, but they're also similar to each other. We still, you know, regardless of what time period we're looking at, we pretty much always have a crescent-shaped blade with an upward-facing hook on the back and a pole and a butt spike. And while it, you know, it may not be that, it may not seem that surprising that the weapon has mostly maintained shape throughout its history, I think when we compare this to other uh, Chinese weapons, it, it's really much more surprising. So for instance, behind me I have a I have a, a po dao, or which is often called pu dao. This is a hanwei pu dao. And then I have uh, what's kind of kind of a homemade uh, jian ma dao up here. So it's another uh, pole arm. And, and both of these terms, po dao and jian ma dao, um, these terms at different points in Chinese history refer to different kinds of weapons, very di very differently shaped weapons. Um, sometimes they're just basically two-handed swords, and then other times they're more like pole arms. So there's really a lot of variety in the shapes that, these we that those weapons can take on. And by comparison, the Guandao is much more distinctive and much more consistent. Uh, if you're interested in more learning more about how some of those weapons uh, change shape, I highly recommend. Um, there are a couple of videos by Chad Ironmonger, Chad Eisner. I'll put some links to his videos in the down below. He also has a great uh, blog post on the Jan Ma Dao talking about its development. By comparison, the Guandao is very kind of consistent in its shape. Now, why would the Guandao be so consistent, whereas other weapons, you know, sort of change back and forth? Um, I can't say for sure, but my uh, uh, kind of my feeling is that the Guandao, other like other, unlike other weapons, was very closely associated with one particular mm, person or, or figure. So that is uh, Guan Yu. So Guan Yu is uh, a was a historical person. He becomes uh, popular in various forms of literature and performance. And he is worshipped as a, a martial god 
for uh, many centuries in China, his his cults start to pick up and take shape in the Song period and last, you know, yeah, for a thousand years into the present. Um, and the Guan Dao is very commonly associated with, with Guan Yu. It's kind of one of his things, it's one of his characteristics. So I think the fact that the weapon is associated with that iconography kind of helps reinforce what it looks like in the popular mind of people and it kind of keeps that shape um, important and consistent. So that gives you an idea of what the kind of general shape of a guandao is. Now let's let's talk about the length. So I think while we're talking about the length of a guandao, there are two important um, features to consider. First is the overall length and second is the blade length or maybe more accurately the kind of ratio of blade length to overall length. So the the modern weapon that I was looking at here, this Wu Shu Guandao, is 76 inches overall and it has a 20 inch blade. And I think that's a pretty typical length for Guandao that are used in, in modern martial arts practice. But we can certainly see a lot of variation. I think on the shorter end I've definitely seen Guandao that are 72 inches or, or maybe even shorter than that. And um, uh, kind of at the upper end, I, I've, I've seen Guandao that are advertised as being 85 inches. Although that seems to, I find that those kinds of weapons hard to find. Usually we see, you know, 76, 78, maybe 80, 82 inches, kind of in that range with, you know, so, but a lower range of maybe around 72 and an upper range of about 85. For blade length, 20 is also kind of at the lower end. We'll see 20 inch blades, 22 inch blades, 24 inch blades. Um, I've occasionally seen 26 inch blades. I think there probably are uh, Guandao out there for sale that have longer blades, but they're hard to find and uh, I haven't seen very many of them. And of course when you're shopping on these uh, wholesale martial arts websites, I find that the, the numbers they give you for you know how long the weapon is or how much it weighs are pretty suspect and oftentimes you don't end up getting what you, what you thought you were getting when you paid for it. Um, word to the wary if you haven't bought a lot of uh, martial arts weapons online. Um, but so, okay, so if we're talking about length, so that gives us kind of a lower range of overall length of about maybe 72 inches to 85 inches and blade length probably between 20 and 26 inches. The blade is a, close to a quarter of the length of the overall weapon, maybe approaching a third. Now when we're looking at uh, Guandao from the late imperial period, uh, textual resources are very helpful when we're talking about length because a lot of them do give us, um, you know, kind of proper lengths for Guandao. And not only that, but a lot of the textual sources are very consistent. So a lot of textual sources will tell us that Guandao are uh, between seven and seven and a half chi. Now, chi as a unit of measurement is a little bit tricky because, um, well, first of all, the the length of a chi. Uh, varies o across time in China, but it also can vary according to circumstance. So sometimes chi used in, in specific situations had different lengths. Uh, but I think for the purposes of talking about Guandao, there are two kinds of chi to kind of consider when thinking about w how long the weapons actually were. And so one of those, the basic chi, which is uh, about 12.6 inches, and the other is the zhou chi, which is about 8.5 six inches. So if we're thinking that the weapon is between seven and seven and a half chi, if we're using that shorter measurement of the zhou chi, that would give us about 60 to 65 inches, and the longer measure would, would give us about uh, 88 to 95 inches. Now looking at illustrations of Guandao from the late imperial period, the weapon is often depicted as being really quite long, usually taller than the, the wielder. So in that sense, this longer measurement really makes a lot more sense. Another kind of uh, reason why I would favor that longer measurement is because there's one text, the Wu Bei Yao Lue from the late Ming, that doesn't give a specific length for Guandao, but rather um, gives a proportional length. So it, it says that you know a person, the length of a Guandao should be equal to a, a person when they raise their hand. So if you're standing straight and you raise your hand up however tall that is, is how long your guandao should be. And so for me, I'm about six feet tall, and if I raise my hand up, 
the height is around, I think, 93, 94 inches. So again, within that range of 7 to 7 half or 88 to 95 inches. So that seems to be uh, uh, the proper length about. Looking at physical examples of material culture, that are uh, examples of guandao in museums, there certainly are examples that are shorter and examples that are longer, but still that um, seven to seven and a half chu measurement seems to kind of be a good kind of standard to go by for the most part. Now, looking at blade length, I, again, I find the most useful resource to uh, calculate blade length is the Wu Bei Yao Lue. So this text says that if you have a blade that is six chu and six tun, the blade should be two chu and two tun. So six, six, two, two. So it should be the blade should be one third the overall length of the guandao. Um, and then comparing this to other illustrations of guandao that I've seen, I think if anything, it's probably the lower end of the length of the blade. A lot of illustrations look like the 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 blade takes up even more than one third of the overall length of the weapon. Somewhere so somewhere between maybe thirty and forty percent. There are also one or two texts which give a, a blade length at a little bit less than a third of the, length, the overall length of the weapon. So again, not totally consistent, but some, usually somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of the length of the overall weapon. So when we're kind of comparing these lengths to modern weapons, we really get the sense that modern weapons tend to be much shorter, and in particular the blade tends to be very short uh, by comparison and by ratio. So um, if Again, if I've got my 76-inch Guandao here with a 20-inch blade, let's compare that to uh, a late Imperial Guandao that was between 7 and 7 sure, so maybe 90 inches long with a 30-inch blade. That means that the, this blade is only two-thirds the length of a late Imperial blade, and the weapon overall is just much shorter. Okay, so that gives us an idea of the... Now we've, we've talked about the shape of the weapon, and we've talked about the length of the weapon, now let's move on to the weight. And before I get it started with kind of specific examples, I do want to mention that there is a particular kind of guandao called the wu ke dao. So this is a, a kind of guandao that was specially made for military examinations. And they, it is a very massive version of the weapon. Um, there, um, there is some kind of variation to how big they were, but they were often you know, maybe 150 pounds, intentionally made very heavy for this kind of examination. And so during the examination, you know, the candidate would have to perform a kind of a simple form using this very heavy blade. And you can still find videos online of people, um, you know, performing some kind of a routine using these really massive blades. Um, but of course, you know, that would never be practical in an actual combat situation. The only thing I think you could do with a 150 pound weapon would be to throw it on top of your opponent. Um, so, you know, we're really not talking about the same thing when we're talking about the Wu Ke Dao. Um, so, uh, going back to my, my modern example, this weapon is three and a half pounds. Um, again, though, it's very, you know, it's a very thin, wobbly blade. Um, you certainly can find Guan Dao out today that are, are much heavier than that. Um, a lot of times, heavier versions of the weapons sold for martial arts are made out of stainless steel, which isn't the kind of thing you would want to be using for uh, sparring or for practice cutting, but for form use it works okay. Um, but And it's considerably heavier than these kind of thin aluminum blades. And um, I have seen advertised as well high carbon uh, guandao, although I ne I've never held a high carbon steel guandao, but I've never used one myself. But there are heavier versions of the blades out there. They're usually um, advertises between like seven and nine pounds. So still, you know, substantial large blades for sure. I've even seen advertised uh, 20 or even 40 pound guandao, which um, I, I, I look at those advertisements as kind of a, you know, with a, with a high level of skepticism, I feel like that's a very high weight for a weapon. Sometimes though they are made with a uh, stainless steel shaft, which, which could potentially add a lot of weight to the weapon too. So it's certainly possible. I've never used one, I've never seen one, but um, they can make them um, quite large and quite heavy. Looking at weights of the weapon in the late imperial period is uh, a little bit more complicated, a little bit more difficult. 
And so that is uh, most of the textual sources that give proper length for Guandao do not necessarily give a proper weight for the Guandao. And when we're looking at material culture, it's really, well, a lot of museum websites don't give the weights of the weapon. They might give the weights of the blade only, or they might just not give a weight at all. Um, and then, of course, even if they do give the weight, it's still, you have to be a bit suspicious because, you know, you don't know if the shaft of the weapon is original. And all, more likely than not, you know, probably the wood rotted away and somebody put a new pole on the weapon. So it's hard to say what would have, you know, what that would mean how that would affect, the, you know, what the original weight would have been. Um, and to make matters worse, the few sources like I can find out for the weight of a Guandao um, are pretty inconsistent. So I'll talk about two textual sources. The first is the Jingguo Xiongluye, and the second is the Wu Bei Yao Lue. Now the Jingguo Xiongluye gives a proper weight of Guandao at uh, five jin. So jin is about the equivalent of 1.3 pounds, so five jin is about six and a half pounds, or three kilos. Um, which is a, you know, a pretty substantial weight, even for a pole weapon. It's certainly um, pretty heavy, but even that pales in comparison to the Wu Bei Yao Lue, which gives a proper weight at between, or it gives a range of weights between 10 and 20 jin. So that's 13 to 26 pounds or uh, 6 to 12 kilos. So the lower end of that range is twice that of the Jingguo Xiongluye, and the higher range of that is uh, quadruple the weight given in the Jingguo Xiongluye. So in the Wu Bei Yao Lue, we're talking about really massive, heavy weapons, assuming we're taking the author at their word. Um, however, I, I, I do, I have a little bit of pause with that, I have a little bit of suspicion. I, I wonder if maybe the author of Wu Bei Yao Lue was exaggerating the weight of the weapon. Um, because the Guandao has always had a reputation as being a very heavy weapon. Going back to this figure, Guan Yu, for which the, the weapon is named, and somebody I'll be talking a lot about in future videos. Um, the Guandao's blade, the, the legendary, kind of the original the OG Guandao um, was said to be um, 85 Jin, you know, a very, an exceptionally heavy weapon. So it always has this reputation of being a really massive heavy weapon. So it could be that the author of Wu Bei Yao Lue was kind of exaggerating the weight to make it sound, you know, more badass or something. But when we're talking about weights of Guandao, so I think, first of all, it is important to note that a lot of the modern Guandao are far too light by comparison to the, uh, the versions of the weapon from the late imperial period, but I think it's also worth noting that um, given that the butt spikes of Guandao in the late imperial period um, had a lot of variation, you know, some of them were really quite small and some of them were really quite large, that suggests to me that the way the weapon was wielded um, could have been very, very different depending on, you know, what kind of a blade you were wielding, even though the overall shape of the weapon is very consistent. That that one detail is really um, has a substantial. It could have a substantial impact on how the weapon was wielded. So to kind of just summarize, kind of very quickly, the um, the shape of the we of Guanda has been very consistent uh, over time and kind of even uh, among different blade makers uh, in the late imperial period. Whereas the and the length of the weapon in the late imperial period was fairly consistent, although very different from the weapons we're using today. Um, the weight, on the other hand, is um, not only kind of very different by comparing modern blades with historical ones, uh, but it also appears as though it may have been very different among different Guanda during the late imperial period, and certainly the kind of the point of balance of the weapon and the way it, it, it was wielded may have also been very affected by the fact that um, the, the weight and weight dis distribution of the weapon is very different. So that's all I have today. Um, thank you very much for watching. I hope you found it interesting and helpful. And um, if you uh, have any uh, thoughts you'd like to add or any questions you'd like to ask, feel free to let me know in the down below. Um, I always appreciate a like and a subscribe and a share, word of mouth, whatever you want to throw my way. Um, other than that, I'll see you next time on Me, Trying Guandalfa, Secretly Transmitted Methods of the Guandalfa.